Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Kevin Vallier. He's Associate Professor of Philosophy at Bowling Green State University, and he contributed the chapter on Rawlsianism to Libertarianism.org's book, Arguments for Liberty. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Kevin. Uh, Thank you for having me. Who is John Rawls? Well, for many people, John Rawls is the most important political philosopher of the 20th century. Um, He is uh, famous for a wide variety of reasons, um, but they all are sort of centrally concentrated on his 1971 book, A Theory of Justice. Uh, The Theory of Justice uh, he develops there uh, is widely known as what's called justice is fairness. And uh, Rawls basically says that our social institutions are just when they're organized in accord with two principles. Uh, First, uh, uh, a principle of liberty where people uh, are owed uh, a certain wide range of personal and civil liberties. And then a a second principle, which is actually two, that social and economic inequalities have to uh, both be open uh, to to all or rather half the uh, political powers and offices uh, available in society have to be uh, equally available to all um, and that uh, social and economic qualities also have to work to the maximal advantage of the least advantaged. Uh, that latter part's actually called the difference principle, and it's the principle that Rawls is most famous for. So, so John Rawls is the philosopher who defended a liberal theory of justice known as justice as fairness, which is uh, comprised by those two and really three principles. Now, um, if you think about, I mean, that was uh, fairly complex, but in terms of the way people might know about him because actually John Rawls has been referenced by politicians, uh, but they're not usually libertarian or conservative politicians. It's generally been interpreted to endorse something like a modern social welfare state. The interesting thing about that is how little influence Rawls has among politicians. I mean, he's a liberal egalitarian in the sense that he's a, a big believer in uh, the redistribution of wealth, extensive social insurance, and even at, at times public ownership of some of the means of production. Uh, despite his liberalism being extremely left-leaning, um, he has all, the smallest fraction of influence um, in comparison to figures like Marx or e- even a variety of 20th century Marxist or uh, postmodern uh, intellectuals. It's kind of surprising. I think it has to do with the density of his work. That, that could be. I definitely – I've heard him referenced more by – in a popular sense. Yeah. Um, and, and I think part of that, as I said, just it, it, it's assumed, which is why your chapter is so interesting in a book about arguments for liberty, but it's, it's sort of assumed that uh, we, that he is the philosopher that justifies the the kind of situation most Western democracies have, which is some amount of, of freedom and civil liberties, but a pretty robust welfare state. So somewhere between Marxism and pure capitalism. Social democracy. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's interesting that. I mean, when, when a theory of justice came out, a lot of people did sort of think of it that way. And in his later restatement of his position in Justice and Fairness and Restatement, he actually says more clearly than in the theory of justice that the welfare state is actually unjust. Um, the welfare state's unjust because it doesn't um, correct for inequalities in the holdings of wealth and capital, that it can create a permanent underclass of people who think um, that they're living off of other people, and that in fact, the government needs to be even more involved. It needs to redistribute capital holdings um, uh, widely to many people. Uh, and this is a system of what's known as property-owning democracy. So it adds that capital dispersing and redistributing function to the welfare state. He was even open to liberal socialism, which would add to those two things, um, modest public ownership of the means of production. So actually Rawls is is quite left-wing um, in his economic theory, which makes this chapter even uh, more surprising, I think. <laughs> so Rawls, was he when he wrote Theory of Justice in 1971, you said? Yeah. Um, was he – what was he responding to in the field of political philosophy? Like we, we often hear that he kind of revitalized political uh-huh. philosophy that was moribund before he showed up. So what did the field look like and was he responding to a particular thing happening in it? I would say there's a, there's a couple of things. First, and, and sort of this is the, the general story that's told, um, in the 20s and 30s, um, Anglo-American philosophy began to be very influenced um, by logical positivism. Uh, 
Um, and on on this view, the only sort of meaningful and interesting and important philosophical questions um, had to be in some way uh, given empirically verifiable or falsifiable answers. And as a result of that general attitude, um, the whole field of ethics and political philosophy contracted uh, dramatically because normative claims uh, don't seem like they're subject to empirical verification. How do you empirically verify that murder is wrong? Um, so for several decades, at least within philosophy departments, political philosophy went in um, into hibernation. And while there are a number of people writing in the 50s and 60s um, that were trying to revive it, Rawls is remembered as the person who did the most to sort of bring it back by offering a kind of systematic uh, uh, and careful and clear approach to these issues. When so he's seen as reviving political philosophy. He was one of a number of figures, but he sort of went from being first among equals to Pope, I suppose. You mentioned the, the two principles of justice, uh, yeah. which, which typically Rawls is, is – He's very he's very long winded. He tries to be very clear, but it is somewhat of a difficult read. But those two principles uh, are usually not actually what he is most remembered for. I mean, the difference principle, but it's usually the process that that he uses to think of these quote unquote think of these two principles, which is known as the veil of ignorance. What what is the veil of ignorance? All right, so so I'll speak to that. Though I think. I should add one more thing in response to your last question, which is that Rawls is also understood as res as responding to utilitarianism and by providing a rejection of utilitarianism and utilitarian approaches to politics. Um, so that's important, I think, for, for, for listeners to know. But to your um, other question, so um, what Rawls wants to do to try to – he wants to try to figure out what the true principles of justice are. and the way that he proposes to do this is by con developing a kind of social contract procedure on which people under certain idealized conditions will choose particular principles of justice. And if you get the idealization right, if that idealization represents certain moral commitments that we have, then the choice that's made under those conditions will uh, actually uncover what the correct principles of justice are, the later he would say the, the principles that are most reasonable for us. Um, the veil of ignorance is uh, a thought experiment, which is intended to try to help us figure out what the right principles of justice are, given our sort of deeply held, considered convictions about uh, moral and political uh, matters. Uh, and the veil, what the veil of ignorance does is it asks people to consider what principles of justice they would choose abstracted from a wide array of contingent facts about uh, their society and about themselves. Uh, so, for instance, you're to abstract away from your race, your gender, your class, your religion or philosophy of life, um, the country that you live in, its level of economic development – uh, your social position broadly, your own history, even your own natural talents. And under those conditions, you're supposed to be making fair and rational choices or, or rational and reasonable choices because you don't have appeal to any factors that would unfairly or irrationally bias your opinion. And so choice under those conditions would be fair, and so they're most likely to arrive at fair principles, principles that will be the correct principles of justice. So that's what he's trying to do with the veil of ignorance. Behind the veil of ignorance, we're ignorant of all of these factors that would bias us, and when we are ignorant of the factors that would bias us, the choice that we would make will yield what justice requires. I, so when he's looking for these principles of justice, are these kind of free-floating – like justice is something that exists out there in the universe in some sort of platonic form or is this justice as it is for us as embodied beings? Because it seems like the – if you – all of those things that he's asking us to strip away are the things that make us human. They're, they're like who we are and so we're then – we're like choosing a – we're choosing – a justice that is detached from the very things that like matter to us most. So this is this is actually a, a pretty interesting question because Rawls very much, and this becomes very clear later in his work, 
uh, after a theory of justice, and it's actually clearer before in his articles before theory of justice, um, that he thinks that the enterprise of the theory of justice is about making sense of the convictions of our society broadly. And that we're trying to choose principles of justice, not for purely abstract people, but for the societies in which we live. And he thinks it's very important that the correct principles of justice be stable under free conditions, um, at least under certain uh, idealized or favorable conditions. Um, so he's not interested in just identifying some sort of mind independently true principles of justice, if Rawls even believed there was such a thing. Um, he's interested in a choice of principles of justice for us. So then that creates a a very important question, which is, well, why exactly did he choose such an abstracting approach? Well, he thinks that our self-understanding as thinking of justice as being impartial, well, or rather uh, based in reciprocity, as he would put it, means that um, we already think about justice as abstracting away from these factors about ourselves. And I think in many cases, it, it, he was right. I mean, right, we don't think that the principles of justice should depend on your race or your your gender or your level of wealth. Um, but to abstract away, say, from your natural talents and your religion, now that's, that's going sort of too far. But I do think most people would agree that at least some of the things that we're ignorant of behind the veil of ignorance aren't taking us too far away from real people and their real self-understanding. I sometimes describe, you know, the elevator pitch of, of Rawls's veil of ignorance process as an attempt to try and make traits that are irrelevant to justice not matter. Such yeah. as, and then the real question is, what traits are irrelevant to justice? But as you pointed out, if you said, you know, I if you I always say that, okay, imagine you're going to have a society where there will be people with black on the white right side of their face and white on the left side of their face yeah. and then the flip side like the Star Trek episode. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't know if you're going to have black on the right or left side of your face, but you still have to design the society. So you presumably will not design it to hurt just one of those uh, right. groups of people. And the way to do that is to keep people from knowing what they're going to be when they enter into the society. This makes – this is I think a huge part of the appeal. It, there's something really intuitively appealing about Rawls and it's a really good testament to the fact that if you're a philosopher and you come up with like a really memorable mind game that makes intuitive sense, it can give you – it can get you a long way in your career. Yeah. Well, that's that's certainly true. <laughs> um, I, I, I Yeah, I think that the – that is one of the attractions of Rawls, and though it's been also endlessly controversial, and it's also been something that many people have found propellant. Um, um, and I don't use that word uh, lightly. I mean, some people really, really hate Rawls. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever reason, his work tends to inspire very strong reactions, both people who find it intuitive and people who don't. So we, let's go to the difference principle and sort of get down into into the, the libertarian uh, possibilities behind Rawls, but the, the but the difference principle. Yeah, let is a me big read it out for the reader. Let me just just get the right formulation on the table. So the difference principle is that social and economic equalities, uh, rather inequalities, social and economic inequalities, are to be to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. So this means this is not purely egalitarian. You're allowed to be in, unequal. Yes. But it has to be a, an inequality that is to the greatest advantage of the least well off. And just kind of, I think, actually, I think, ask you a question and then help illustrate this for our listeners. You do at one point in your chapter say that you're not going to talk about whether or not capitalism itself can satisfy the difference principle because that would be one way of interpreting it when we say, hey, having uh, unequal – uh, Steve Jobs, uh, it really helps out poor people. It helps out people with the fact that he's so rich to have an iPhone in their pocket and they can become Uber drivers and all this stuff. So that's an inequality that is allowed because it helps the, the least off. But you say you're not going to do that that process. Yeah, so there's there's a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of libertarians have already pursued the argument that, say, capitalism works to the greatest benefit for the least advantaged. Um, another reason, though, is that the classical liberal philosophers who have tried to engage Rawls's thought in order to defend the principles of a free society have tended not to go that route um, for a number of different reasons. Uh, one is that the difference principle is not Rawls's first principle. Um, the liberty principle is the first principle, and – 
Um, the liberty principle is what Rawls said was lexically prior to this to the to the difference principle. So that means that satisfying it has to come first in cases of conflict. Um, and it might be the case, for instance, there's a more promising Rawlsian route to the principles of free society, given the priority of liberty. And if, for instance, economic liberties turn out to be part of that principle, um, that's going to give a sort of more powerful uh, defense. Um, there's some other reasons, too. Um, but I think you know, f for listeners, that's, I think, one reason that you don't want to just say, oh, well, capitalism helps the difference principle because, you know, we've got this this liberty principle to explore. Um, so I think that's 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 one kind of uh, consideration. Uh, it also goes to the idea that this is a fundamentally non-consequentialist theory. You know, it's what we call a deontological theory where uh, the, the justice of outcomes doesn't depend solely on their consequences. Um, and so if you really want to work out a kind of non-consequentialist Rawlsian approach to, uh, say, economic justice, um, you don't want to just appeal to whatever works to the greatest benefit, the least advantage. You want to appeal to all the different features of that, that theory of justice um, in order to defend a free society. So I have maybe a big question because I think it draws in a lot of what we've discussed um, with – so with the, the difference principle, um, there's a question there of – what it is that we're maximizing when we're maximizing the the minimum? You know, are we yeah. are we talking about um, material wealth? Are we talking about subjective satisfaction and so on? And then, but but the reason I'm thinking about that is because when you say you know, so we would we would all if behind the veil of ignorance we've abstracted away all of these these kind of arbitrary traits um, or contingent traits, and these are the principles that we would agree to. Um, that that we would agree to a system where like you could have inequalities as long as those inequalities benefited ultimately the people at the bottom. But we see the like really hardcore egalitarians today, the people very concerned about, say, income inequality, um, even if you make the argument that like, look, you know, these people being very wealthy, it they created a lot of jobs and they did enormous benefits for the poor, you know, so like on the policy side, we'll make the argument that yes, the the people who own Walmart are extraordinarily wealthy, but Walmart has created so much good in terms of lower prices for food and so on and so forth for so many people. But they say no, there's just something inherently bad about the very fact of inequality itself. Um, but it seems like Rawls would would say that kind of attitude is just not allowed behind the veil of ignorance or it's not the kind of thing that people would agree to like so are these so what what are we maximizing do these kind of psychological traits get abstracted away like the very fact that we just were envious people maybe or we we don't like seeing others with more than us um and then how do we how do we tease out what is reasonable agreement or not reasonable like how do we say no you're you know you re if you were reasonable you'd agree to this so the fact that you don't agree to this means you're not reasonable so so the reasonableness uh issue is pretty vexed i, I think we'll start with the, the somewhat easier of those two difficult questions um having to do with certain kinds of psychological dispositions and what what role those play uh, in the veil of ignorance, and 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 the answer is essentially what we're trying to do is we're not we're not building. We, people can appeal to the ordinary facts of economics and psychology, um, something Rawls says. But the the choosers behind the veil of ignorance don't aren't thought to have any fundamental desires of that sort. They're abstracted uh, uh, away from um, so pretty much any kind of sectarian or abnormal or unusual or even corrupt uh, desire. Um, what they're essentially doing, they're, they're a philosophical fiction intended to give us an idea of a, uh, of a fair and rational choice of, of, of principles. Um, now, features about how to address our psychology and how justice fits in with our psychology and to what extent envy matters, Rawls actually talks about this in A Theory of Justice, um, but it comes towards the last third of the book, which very few people read. And a lot of it has to do with the way in which justice is fairness is supposed to mesh with our moral psychology. So the choosers themselves are not going to be subject to these considerations, but um, Rawls does address those kinds of uh, concerns. Uh, and he does find that there are certain ways of being preoccupied with equality uh, 
uh, that are uh, unhelpful or uh, are somehow inappropriate to shaping society. Um, as far as reasonableness goes, um, this is a pretty complicated issue because it becomes a huge um, a point of contention in his next big work, um, uh, Political Liberalism. But the, the, the basic idea of what's going on in the earlier book is that you're using the term reasonable to try to refer to something that goes beyond just mere rational choice. So the choosers behind the veil of ignorance are meant to model a reasonable and rational choice. And it's a reasonable choice because it's fair and reciprocal. So the idea is that the reasonable goes beyond mere sort of uh, practical rationality and allows us to say that certain kinds of rational bargains would be morally inappropriate or morally problematic. Say one that was based on um, my extracting a benefit from you just based on a threat that I make to you of not cooperating with you or something along those lines. Now, you discuss uh, – you, we kind of alluded to it a little bit, but you discuss two other theorists uh, who are – in the classical liberal libertarian camp, broadly speaking, who kind of write in the tradition of Rawls but adapt it uh, or not adapt it, interpret it in a, such a way or argue in such a way that certain classical liberal or libertarian principles would be uh, acceptable. The first one is John Tomasi uh, who is a philosopher at Brown University and he – in his theory of this focus is more as you put out on the first principle, correct? That's right. Yeah, I mean, it also he also talks about the second principle, but I, I think the the main innovation um, in John's uh, approach, Tomasi's approach uh, to Rawls, is in uh, the development of the first principle um, uh, in a very different direction from from Rawls. And what does he argue? So, um, Tomasi thinks of. Rawls as one of a group of theorists that he refers to following Sam Freeman, who's a, uh, a philosopher and ex major expositor of Rawls, calls high liberalism. And high lib the high liberal view is a kind of left-wing egalitarian liberalism that draws a really sharp distinction between uh, traditional liberal liberties like civil liberties, freedom of speech, religion, uh, procedural liberties like the right to fair trial, political liberties like the right to vote uh, on the one hand, and then the classical liberal economic liberties on the other. And they think the first set of civil liberties should be protected uh, at the sort of highest moral and constitutional level. And the other uh, liberties, these traditional classical liberal liberties like freedom of contract should be uh, basically discarded or dramatically curtailed. And Tomasi says that um, this is a kind of what he calls economic exceptionalism, and that all the same arguments that would lead Rawlsians to prioritize uh, these personal and civil liberties apply with equal force, or at least with nearly as much force, to the case for the traditional classical liberal liberties. Uh, and so he's arguing against economic exceptionalism uh, in order to um, in order to sort of come up with his own sort of alternative to justice's fairness or free market fairness. So that means that if you're uh, respecting the equal liberties principle or the liberties principle of, of of the first principle of justice, that means you include things like the right to earn a living and the right to contract, and then you you get a even if you run through the rest of the principles of justice, you get something that looks pretty classical liberal at the end of that. That's right. In fact, it's it's not even clear how much more room there is for other the other principles to function, which is something that some people have criticized Tomasi for. Because, you know, it, it, if you have these strong classical liberal liberties, it's not clear what the rest of sort of social justice can do. Um, so let's sort of here's a sort of way to make it a little more. Uh, nuanced um, the view. Um, Rawls actually acknowledges that there are two basic liberties that are economic liberties and that, that are absolutely fundamental on the same level as freedom of speech. The first one is the right to own personal property, you know, like family heirlooms and clothes and, and stuff like that. And the second is a right to freedom of occupation. So the, the problem with command economy socialism for Rawls is that the government tells you what job you have to have. And a really good question that Tomasi is able to pick up on is why only those two? 
Why does Rawls restrict the basic liberties to those two? Because those are fundamental liberties. They must be protected for a society to be just, legitimate, and stable among real people. Um, and so, you know, John gives this example. Like you imagine this uh, a woman who, say, is a small business owner, Amy's pup in the tub, and she's responsible for, uh, you know, basically uh, cleaning, you know, grooming, dog grooming. Um, and you think, I mean, to develop her own life in her own way, her own projects, her own uh, morality, uh, that she ought to have not just, you know, the liberty of where to work, but the liberty to own a small business and operate it according to her own wishes within certain kinds of constraints. Uh, so the way I like to put this point in my, my own work is that if you think there's a, a right to choose where to work, that implies a right to go into business for yourself. And, you know, imagine that Amy ran the pup in the tub out of her home, which is her personal property. Um, she's using her home as capital. And so it seems like if you acknowledge these two liberties, you should acknowledge her, uh, at least a restricted right to own capital, which is how you get the case for capitalism off the ground. So what Tomasi wants to say is, you know, look, you just can't divide up the case for liberties and get all the egalitarian liberal liberties you want, but not get the classical liberal liberties and his this sort of case of Amy's Pup at the Tub is supposed to help illuminate that. Why does Rawls only privilege those particular economic liberties? Why is he less concerned about the others? I mean, you could the the kind of cute psychologizing answer might be that those the ones that he seems to think are important are the ones that, as you know, a tenured professor at Harvard matter to him. Like he's not really he's not interested in starting his own small business and probably neither are many of his friends, but you know, he needs to be able to own his books and he wants to be able to choose what he writes about. But is it is there a more philosophical reason for not accepting this this wider range of economic liberties? You know, I thought I thought a lot about this and um Rawls just doesn't help give us much help on that question at all, far less than he should have. My best guess is that when he's writing at the time, those classical liberal liberties are extremely controversial. And he's starting this project, thinking about this project in the late 40s, early 50s. It's developing throughout the 60s in a time where classical liberalism is in a bad way. Um, and I think he's thinking that those liberties are just ones that are not part of our shared uh, self-understanding um, in the way that um, you know freedom of occupation is. Now, I, I, but that still doesn't it still doesn't make sense. I mean, however popular socialism, full-blown socialism was, and the liberal democratic countries never abrogated the fundamental right to own private capital. They nationalized some major industries, um, but they never destroyed small businesses and and you know it's so it's it's very peculiar that he didn't have almost anything to say at all i mean it's it's incredible really um so i'm at a loss i just don't know what to say um i know that for the harder core classical liberty liberties like really strong freedom of contract there's going to be standard worries that you know people will recognize more from Marx about those being sort of fake liberties. They're liberties of the rich to oppress the poor. Um, but when it, but if you sort of pare it down a bit, you don't allow, say, freedom of contract to, you know, allow a businessman to pay someone no matter you know anything they want to pay them, no matter how little. Um, or you put a limit on saying a pharmaceutical company can't charge a million dollars for life saving. Like, just suppose you just restricted freedom of contract just a bit. Um, to get rid of some of these seemingly nastier cases, why not endorse that? I mean, why not endorse a modified, a sort of limited freedom of contract? And I don't know the answer. I just don't. I don't know the answer. Yeah, that's, that, that, I, I've wondered the same thing, and the best I've come up is something something similar to what you just said. Um, moving out of th a theory of justice, and you mentioned this a little bit previously that Rawls' ideas started changing pretty quickly after a theory of justice to he was sort of working on a, a different but related project that came out in a book called Political Liberalism, which I think was published in the early 90s, if I remember, mid-90s. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Most of the material is getting out of it, getting out there in the 80s. But it's um, – but yeah, it's – it's uh, the, the, the first edition is a 1993, I believe. And what, what is he – what is his 
new task there, or I mean, I guess it's related to his previous task. But what is what is his? How is he thinking about it now in that book? This is a an interesting question on which there's been a lot of recent scholarship. It's complex, and I I will try to to keep it as simple as I can. Um, Rawls thought a very important thing for a, th- a, a conception of justice to do, like it, like his two principles, uh, would be that it could keep a society under favorable conditions stable f- in a moral way. So, for instance, a society could be stable in an immoral way if you just have a dictator that's just really good at crushing opposition and dissent. But Rawls wanted uh, a liberal society to be one where people could affirm the conception of justice they lived under. Uh, after sustained moral reflection uh, on those institutions. They want to see them as things that they can endorse and comply with freely. Uh, And so it was very important for Rawls for a a conception of justice to be stable. But in a theory of justice, the account of stability he gives involves embracing certain kinds of goods and excellences and sort of ignoring or downplaying others. And Rawls eventually came to realize that in his own understanding of of a a stable society, what he called a well-ordered society, there would be a dynamic that would lead it to unravel and destabilize on its own. And this is what he called uh, the fact of reasonable pluralism. And this is basically the fact that reasonable people can fundamentally disagree about ultimate religious, moral, uh, and political matters. They can disagree about the conception of the good life in particular. Uh, And so they would end up with different what Rawls called reasonable comprehensive doctrines. Uh, And this meant that there was not going to be any one story that you could tell about why people had a particular moral reason to be just or to go along with principles of justice. Um, And so what he tries to do is reconstruct his model of a well-ordered society um, to take the form of what he called an overlapping consensus. So you would take a conception of justice like the two principles and say, okay, well, as long as everybody from their own comprehensive doctrine can accept the two principles, then a society could be stable in the right way or could be stable for the right reasons. Uh, and so basically what he's doing is saying, I want to I want a just society to be one that's stable for moral reasons, but people are going to come to freely disagree about morality. And that means we have to see if justice and fairness can be justified to multiple reasonable points of view. Uh, and out of that problem, the project of political liberalism grows. So is this different than no, sort of I, we talk a lot today about conservatives and Democrats and how different their worldview is and maybe they're not even agreeing on the fundamental things that government should be doing and what it's for and it's becoming a big problem because maybe there's not an overlapping consensus. Is it something like that or am I, am I dumbing it down a little bit too much? Um, no, you're not dumbing it down. Um, all of a lot of these questions are are com- are are complex ones because Rawls just his his views have a lot of moving parts. Um, but it's something it's something like that when people. It's not. It's not really about political ideology because at least until very late in Rawls's career, he just didn't think there was going to be that much reasonable disagreement about justice which is usually what conservatives and libertarians and progressives disagree about. He was thinking more about conceptions of the good, and he's particularly thinking about religious people, and he's thinking about people with secular uh, moral doctrines like utilitarians or Kantians. And so he's trying to show how his conception of justice and maybe some other related ones can be accepted by different groups who have different understandings of the good life. Um so that's really the kind of pluralism or reasonable pluralism he's worried about addressing. Now, late, he starts to see that reasonable people can disagree about justice. Um, but um, he, and I, in my opinion, somewhat notoriously says that uh, libertarianism is not a reasonable conception of justice. Um, so he's bending over backwards to accommodate religious people, uh, including, I mean, he says every major <laughs> of the major religions ought to be able to be politically liberal, but not libertarianism. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So this and is he's, more got, about- he's got Nozick down the hall, remember, right? So, I mean, they're both there at the same time, right? He's just down the hall, right? And this guy's beyond the pale for Rawls. So, so um, that, gets, that comes back to that question I asked earlier about reasonable disagreement and reasonable doctrines because it seems yeah. like it's almost either – 
circular or maybe stacking the deck to say like, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to figure out all of these reasonable people, you know, what they would agree on is justice, um, is is the, you know, are the principles of justice that we're going to use. But, um, but at the same time, the way that we kind of judge whether they're reasonable in the first place is what sorts of principles they endorse. So presumably Nozick down the hall is – is an irrational person because his principles and his core ideas are are themselves irrational or just nuts. Um, so is this is it is it circular? Is there a way to meaningfully get to figuring out which people are rational or reasonable and which ones aren't without picking your your end goal and then seeing which ones line up with it first? I mean, literally, if you read the text, Rawls' definition of the reasonable is circular. Like he defines reasonable people in terms of affirming reasonable doctrines and reasonable doctrines is one that could be affirmed by reasonable people. And so <laughs> it's very hard to sort through exactly what the reasonable is and, and, and what what can do with it. Um, but let's suppose we're trying to give our best – reconstruction of roles. And I take it what a reasonable person is supposed to be is they've got sort of two dispositions. Um, one, they're going to recognize that there's reasonable pluralism. Or they recognize what Rawls called the burdens of judgment. So they're going to believe that other people can disagree with them about the good and so on without being of bad will and as uh, without being fundamentally confused or stupid or irrational. Um, the other condition is that you be prepared to propose reciprocal terms of cooperation, like that the rules that go for you will go for me and vice versa. If you have those two features, that you believe in reasonable pluralism and you're prepared to offer reciprocal terms of cooperation, then you're reasonable. So then why wouldn't why wouldn't Nozick be Reasonable, except for I mean, maybe maybe Rawls just thought he used an unreasonable amount of italics in his writing, or something. <laughs> but I mean, that, those things seem, would seem to apply to Nozick. You know, it's um, it's weird. Um, there's this one section in political liberalism about it, and it has to do with the fact that he thinks that libertarians see the state as like a corporation, and that our self understanding of government is that it is a public entity that is supposed to represent all of society as a collective whole. And so and so that's the problem with Nozick's view is it sees the state as, you know, basically a sort of fiduciary institution. However, uh, suppose that were a fair criticism of 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 Nozick and whether it is I think is well, it's complicated. Um uh but there are plenty of libertarian views on which that just isn't true. I mean it's just not true of Hayek, for instance. He doesn't see the state as just a sort of another private corporation. Um, and there's a variety – you know, I mean James Buchanan isn't going to see it that way. Milton Friedman is not going to see it that way. Um, I mean Nozick doesn't say give us a theory of democracy or anything like that. But you know, I mean most classical liberals have been some kind of small d. Uh, Democrat, despite wanting very strong constitutional protections of liberties, but Rawls wanted strong constitutional protections of liberties. So, I mean, uh, I think that you know, if you have a sort of constitutionalist libertarianism, uh, I don't think Rawls can rule you out as having an unreasonable conception of justice, and certainly he can't rule out John Tomasi's free market fairness, which is quite libertarian, as being unreasonable because <laughs> it's just so much like his view, uh, it would be very difficult for him to rule it out. So, so long story short, um, libertarianism in the Nozickian or Rothbardian form isn't the only kind. And so even though I don't think Rawls' criticism of Nozick is successful, it just doesn't touch plenty of versions of libertarianism. So it's just not uh, – I mean remember, Rawls wants re utilitarianism to be reasonable. So I mean that's going to include like a gigantic number of libertarians. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean – I think that I always got the, the sort of – I kind of believe that Rawls just didn't spend a lot of time thinking about libertarian theory. It just wasn't the circles that he walked. I mean he had Nozick there, but I don't well, know how, how much they – but they, he didn't go to the parties or – so I, don't, I just think it wasn't what he was really talking about. Um, 
but I want we were talking about political liberalism and and this sort of idea of of uh, overlapping consensus, as Rawls calls it. But but there's another guy you write about in your chapter, Jerry Gauss, Gerald Gauss, who's a philosopher at uh, Arizona, correct? Yes. And uh, he. He goes more as in where John Tomasi goes for Rawls and talking about one of the things, big things he highlights is what are the rights and liberties of the people. Like Jerry Gauss is really looking more at the, the the kind of things that Rawls is wrestling with in political liberalism. That's right. Um, so Tomasi is explicitly engaging Rawls in a in a way of developing a Rawlsian view. Uh, Gauss was working on political liberalism at the same time Rawls was developing it. And there are certain ways in which he's building on Rawls and is built on Rawls, but there's other ways in which his project is more self-contained. Um, but there is an affinity in, in this way. There's a question about how we are to have an ongoing system of social cooperation that preserves our understanding of persons as free and equal and treating others with respect, but that also recognizes – that disagreement about fundamental moral and normative matters um, is inelimitable from political life. So it's also a social contract theory in that it's trying to justify uh, moral and political order in terms of what can be justified and acceptable to each person. So there's there's a lot of similarities in terms of the project. It's a contract theory and project that is uh, grappling directly with the fact of reasonable disagreement, what Gauss calls evaluative pluralism. Um, and he, the project differs in a, a variety of respects that I uh, explain in the, the chapter, um, but it ends up being more classically liberal um, for uh, a, a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, Gauss thinks that among – in his kind of uh, original position equivalent, um, there are a lot more different kinds of disagreements uh, that are present. So, I mean, really in Rawls's veil of ignorance, everybody's so abstracted that they all end up agreeing um, about they, – they all end up pretty much agreeing on all the same views. And so it's not even really a bargain at all, um, even though it's presented as one. Uh, but for Gauss, he allows just a lot more diversity and disagreement, weighting of different values and things like that. And so he thinks there's sort of certain fundamental liberties like Rawls does that includes some economic liberties. But he also thinks that the case for some rights that we have is that they help us to resolve disagreements that we couldn't otherwise resolve. So, for instance, one of his main arguments, contractarian arguments for a right of private property – is it because people disagree so much about the good life and they disagree so much about justice? We need economic and political institutions that allow us to go our own way and to live our own lives. And so a fundamental argument for a, a strong right, not a fully libertarian right, but a strong right of private property, is that it helps to economize on disagreement. So, for instance, the reason that socialism for Gauss can't be justified to each person or what he calls publicly justified um, is that the you know people can't agree on which plan to appeal to. People can't agree on what all to do in their publicly owned housing complex even. Um, and so um, part of the case for market order and for uh, classical liberalism uh, is that it acknowledges uh, and deals with disagreement – uh, in some really kind of magnificent ways that Rawlsian and egalitarian liberals um, seem uh, at least largely unable to appreciate. Does this end up dealing with the – because something that libertarians talk about a lot because I, I I like the idea in Gauss about private property. It's, it's good fences make good neighbors but in a more profound sense that, yeah. that when you have fundamental ways that you're constructing your life uh, and the, the things that you value uh, – it doesn't really work to have everyone, uh, I don't know, voting about that and trying to control each other's method of deepest held values and deepest held convictions. Uh, and But how does that get us to any sort of – do we have a theory of coercion at all or about the state yes. in Gauss whatsoever? Yeah. So um, it's interesting in Rawls's work, particularly – this is explicit in Justice's Fairness and Restatement and um, it's basically explicit in political liberalism. It's entailed by two explicit things he says. Um, and then that's, there's a presumption against coercion, that if the government is going to coerce, it needs a good reason. And for Gauss, if the government's going to coerce, um, it has to show that the coercion can be justified to the people who are coerced. 
And it turns out that's hard to do in many cases because people reasonably disagree about um, what not only what the state um, is permitted to do, um, but they disagree about the effects of what the state may do. Um, so they're going to disagree about all kinds of things. And so many policies and approaches and, um, you know, constitutional forms uh, are going to be reasonably rejectable by somebody or at least some sizable group. And because Gauss allows for a much broader range of reasonable disagreement than does Rawls, there will be libertarian and conservative members of the public that are reasonable and that have a good reason to reject extensive forms of government. So property owning democracy and liberal socialism can't be publicly justified because of the reasonable re objections of conservatives and libertarians. Now, he doesn't go fully libertarian because he thinks that folks on the left are going to have reasonable objections to that. But the, a key idea is this: there's a problem with coercion. It, ha it is sort of generally bad and that people have a kind of right against legal coercion that can only be met if the laws imposed upon them can be justified to them given their own principles and values. And since so little can be justified, we end up with a pretty libertarian order. So if, if we're saying that the, the role of the market or the reason that this is a, a classically liberal or libertarian theory ultimately is that you know if the people – that one of the benefits of private property and, and limiting coercion is that we're not forcing upon each other those things we can't agree on. Yeah, we, you know, um, but so so in a sense, the the freedom there is kind of a the default. It's like the background. Like, look, you know, if if we can't all agree on what to do, then we're going to do nothing, uh, which is you know letting people have their own property and letting them live their own lives. But it feels like you know you, you look around the the political culture today are latest elections, um, the elections going on in Europe, it's like the one thing that everyone except you know, us principled few at the Cato Institute can agree on is that we should never leave anything to the market. That you know, we may not be able to agree on what government should do, but the not having government do something is is worse. Um, and so is that, you know, how do, do we have to do we have to kind of agree to have all reasonably agree to have the the market and freedom and classical liberalism be that kind of default option to get it off the ground. Um, oh, um, yeah, this is a good question. Um, there's Gauss actually has a number of different things to say about this, um, but I'll just try to stick to the, a basic idea. Um, among the things that he thinks that is recognized widely and cross culturally is a kind of presumption against coercion. And different people think about, you know, which policies are coercive in different ways. Um, but generally, they think if the state's going to coerce, they need a pretty good reason. So he thinks that that basic presumption against coercion runs really deep through humanity. Um, and so um, if you show that not a lot can meet that presumption, it's not that everybody has to endorse libertarianism. It's just that it's an implication of fact that they endorse a presumption against coercion. So in that sense, libertarianism is sort of endorsed by, by implication. People say, OK, we agree on this presumption. Oh, wow, look at how much other people disagree with us. I guess we can't meet that presumption very easily. So the idea is if you can confront people with the fact that so many of their disagreements are fundamentally reasonable ones, um, then they'll get sort of drawn by matter of logical or rational consistency towards a more classically liberal uh, position. Um, it's also the case that Gauss does – does. it's not about what people would agree to sort of uh, as they are. There is idealization in Gauss, though considerably less than there is in Rawls. Um, the idea is that uh, you're, you're trying to determine what's justifiable to people based on their commitments and values and not just whether they say yes or, or no at a particular moment. Um, so you're trying to base the law on div their diverse reasons. Um, but not merely based on, you know, for the fact that people are extremely risk averse and have a sort of re uh, irrational beliefs about what would happen if the government weren't acting. So um, in a publicly justifiable order, there are going to be lots of situations in which you say, yeah, I mean, most people think that uh, this is going to be a disaster, but they don't have any good argument for that. So we can go ahead and have have the policy. Now, we have to be wary about not idealizing too much. We have to be very careful to keep the idealization sort of close to the ground. Um, otherwise, we're going to coerce people without a, a good reason. 
Um, but we're not just going to have the order, the political order, entirely the victim of people's basic irrationalities and biases. Can you clarify? You mentioned that with idealization, and it's it's mentioned in your chapter, and it's an important kind of distinction in political philosophy that the ideal theory versus the non-ideal theory, and Gauss kind of does a little bit of both. It seems like. Yeah, so it's not sort of fully non-ideal theory in the sense that you know you're just looking at power relations and how best to balance them. Um, it's a it's an enterprise within a kind of moral theory that's looking at what we could reasonably aspire to under certain conditions. So, the, so when you in terms of defining a so because because I was we we talk about for example does anyone in this someone who's not very philosophical who's listening to this might be wondering whether or not anyone is talking about the actual behavior of government agents and the actual oh, uh, conditions under which they behave and and we say well that's because it's a different it's a different kind of game we're playing. Yeah. No. For 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 Gauss, when we are choosing the terms of political life, we are able to appeal to the fact that. Um, government agents, for instance, are often going to be self-interested. In Rawls' theory, it's it's so much closer to the ideal theory end of things that you do presume that people generally comply with the law and that government officials are generally well-meaning um, and capable, um, although Rawls doesn't really defend that assumption. But Gauss does not accept that assumption. And I think that's another reason that his view inclines in a classically liberal direction, because once you're prepared to say, Mark, I mean, Rawls thought markets failed all over the place, but there's no role for government failure in his his uh, his theory almost at all. Um, there there may be some little gaps, but for Gauss, they're they're all on the table: market failures, government failures, and what can be justified is going to be based on our best assessment of of which laws accomplish the the ends that we can agree upon. Um, given a, a real social scientific assessment of those those possibilities. So, of these two sorts of Rawlsian classical liberal theories that we talked about, Tomasi's and Gauss's, is there one that you prefer or think is stronger? Yeah. I mean, I'm I should just say to listeners, I mean, I'm I was one of Gauss's students uh, at Arizona. Um and I, I I wrote my dissertation under him. Um so that may be part of the reason I'm partial to the Gaussian view. Um right after I finished at Arizona, I was a postdoc uh, at Brown with Tomasi while he was finishing up free market fairness. So, um, you know, I was influenced by John as well. But um, I inclined towards the Gaussian view. And the reason that I inclined to the Gaussian view, I think maybe the main reason anyway, um, is this. Uh, Rawls acknowledged toward the end of his career that there was reasonable disagreement about justice. And an, if you allow that that runs as deep as reasonable disagreement about the good, you can no more have a free, open, stable society based on a single conception of justice than you can on a single conception of the good. So it's no longer possible, I think, under modern conditions for the Catholic Church to be the dominant political force in a society because there are reasonable, good people who aren't Catholic. Um, and in the same way, we can't have justice as fairness as the basis for justice because there are reasonable good people who are not liberal egalitarians. And so I worry that the project of trying to come up with the correct conception of justice to govern our social order um, is hopeless in the same way that coming up with the right conception of the good uh, 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 is hopeless. So I think that Tomasi is too much like the early Rawls and that his view succumbs to the same kinds of difficulties that led Rawls to political liberalism. And then I think if he'd lived longer, would have led him even away um, from his emphasis on justice as fairness. And Gauss accepts that there's reasonable disagreement about justice, just like there is reasonable disagreement about the good. Um, and I think that's a more realistic uh, place to start uh, doing uh, sort of traditional political theory. So libertarians have typically been fairly dismissive of Rawls. He certainly doesn't have a place in the, the libertarian philosopher pantheon. Um, do you think that Rawls has value for libertarians? Yeah, I, I think he has enormous value and I think he has enormous value for a couple of reasons. Um, first, he's a good philosopher and an important one in his own right uh, and a, Libertarians who are interested in political philosophy can just learn a lot by understanding his view. 
Another reason he's valuable is if you really want to understand what's driving at least certain kinds of elite liberal egalitarian opinion, Rawls is someone to go to to understand those you disagree with. Um, another reason to take Rawls very seriously is that Rawls is a liberal. And libertarians, I think, are broadly liberal as well. And many of the arguments that Rawls uses on behalf of certain kinds of liberal institutions are ones that I think libertarians will find congenial where they just, they agree with liberal egalitarians. Um, but also they'll see, I think, and hopefully by taking a look at the chapter that I wrote, they can see this, that many of the arguments that Rawls gives, he just didn't see that they had libertarian implications. And that by studying Rawls, you might find some very powerful arguments for libertarianism that you may not have otherwise been aware of if you were dismissive of Rawls. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.